Dad, can we talk? Of course. I'm having some trouble with some of your writers. Okay, what's going on? Well, I feel like some of them are phoning it in. So what are the behaviors you're seeing that back up that interpretation? Lack of engagement, barely sharing any ideas. I'm pretty sure one of the guys is only here for the free snacks. That's interesting. What would success look like for your team? Are you coaching me right now? I'm just trying to be helpful. Never mind, Dad. I can handle it. Use the framework. It will help. I've tried laying down the law with this team. I've tried being super nice, but none of it works. What does it take for this team to start working together? One interpretation is our head writer isn't keeping a safe space for creative activities. That's an awfully individual interpretation, Parker. What's your data? Well, you talk the most in the meetings. Do others agree with that? Bear? Tiggy? Jake? Anybody? I'll take your silence as agreement. Well, another interpretation is that some people are here only for the free food. Well, I don't see bears stuffing her face with gummy bears. Well, it's free food, her loss. And you know what? It might be a little insensitive to eat those in front of Bear. She's never said anything to me about it. Because she's not real! Now that's an interpretation we need to test. I think we made a big breakthrough here. Unbelievable. Live from Studio A, somewhere inside the great state of Kansas, it's Leadership Late Night, sponsored by the Kansas Leadership Center. I'm DJ AJ, here to rock the beats and make the tough interpretations. Joining my dad tonight, the Vice President of the University of Kansas Health System, Kenny Wilk. Now, the host of the show, that probably violates several child labor laws, DJ Letter. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Leadership Late Night. I am your host, DJ Wetter, and DJ AJ, thank you, as always, for the very truthful introduction. Well, five weeks into quarantine at the Wetter household, and quite frankly, I'm running out of projects. I've cleaned just about everything. I've built everything I'm capable of building, and uh, I'm not sure what's next. Got into the closet over the weekend. That was quite the journey back in time to what used to be in style or what never was in style, according to my wife. Uh, we cleaned out the garage, found an animal that I hope only spent one winter in that location, but it could have been several, to be honest with you. It's been a while since the garage has been this clean, as I mentioned a few episodes back, and uh, recently cleaned the basement and actually discovered what I thought was a shelving unit was a foosball table. So imagine the entertainment that now exists in the Wetter household because of cleaning out uh, the basement. Now. All that said, I think there is something to controlling what we can control during these tough times, right? My colleague and friend at KLC, Kevin Baumhoff, calls it task completion therapy. I love mowing lawns, for example. And the idea there is by the end of that task, you can see what you've accomplished. And again, in times where we control very little, it feels good to control what we can. The major disappointment here, though, I've done all this work around the house. It's probably never looked better. And thanks to COVID-19, by the time anyone can actually see it, I guarantee you, it'll be a complete mess again. Welcome to the work. Well, DJ AJ, you hit the beats, I'll hit the desk. You got it, Dad. We have a new segment on tonight's show. It's inspired by my good friend, Stephen Colbert. And by my good friend, I mean, he has no idea who I am and I really liked his show on Comedy Central. Well, he used to have a segment called The Word. He used the news of the week to explore a specific word, and I'd like to honor that old segment, KLC style, with an exploration of the behavior. In each installment, we'll use the news to explore a leadership behavior you'll find within the KLC framework. So without further ado, I give you tonight's behavior. Inspire a collective purpose. Defining purpose amidst a global pandemic can be tricky business. Restricting movement to save lives also restricts movement that provides opportunity for commerce, 
community, and normalcy in this country. And yet, there are signs that the U.S. is beginning to flatten the curve. Experts believe the data in some states shows that cases of COVID-19 are plateauing or are near a plateau. One interpretation of that data is social distancing is working. And with that news have come the predictable calls to end stay-at-home orders. The problem with that is the work is only halfway done. Flattening the curve was always going to lengthen the time the virus would hang around. But by lengthening that time frame, the overall deadly impact due to the virus would be reduced, giving the medical community time to do research, stock up on supplies, and allow the world to consider a life after the pandemic. Ending or relaxing social distancing guidelines at the first sign of progress is counter to the purpose of flattening the curve. But as protesters begin to show up around the country calling for America to reopen, I'm left to question if there is a collective behind the stated work of social distancing. Regardless of what state had the protest, there were very similar signs being held up in each location. One oft-repeated version referenced live free, or die, a line in a letter written by John Stark. One interpretation of these signs is that there is a segment of the population that believes the restriction of individual freedoms in the name of collective health is worse than the death and sickness the virus is causing. I have to admit these protests, although statistically unrepresentative of national polls that suggest the public is still in favor of quarantine, still make me sick to my stomach. Deep down, I feel like the protests are a reflection of a lack of collective protection, direction, and order from our state and federal government. I want to scream out to nobody in particular, why can't our leaders get it together? Why can't we have one cohesive message from our federal government? Why can't our state governments put aside politics and project a bipartisan approach to progress? And... Look, I've privately named the individuals that I blame for this lack of national collective purpose to any friends and family that will listen. While naming my frustration can be cathartic, it does little to make progress on collective purpose. And that's what I want us to consider tonight. Inspiring a collective purpose actually requires us to engage with multiple factions, even those who don't see the world how we see it. It requires us to care about something bigger than our individual self in the name of changing the system. And that's where I think the protesters miss the point. Their individual freedom to ignore quarantine increases the collective likelihood of contracting a virus that is deadly and has no concern for politics or economics. And yet, if leadership is an activity and not a position, then authority could certainly be helpful, but will always be insufficient when it comes to making progress on our toughest challenges. So tonight, I commit to the idea that the work starts with me. Collective purpose exists in a space where the work defined is small enough that you can take action, but big enough that others can see themselves in the work. Complaining about elected officials gets me no closer to the change I want in the world. Having honest conversations with friends and family about how we are going to collectively choose to live in this COVID-19 era may be a better place to start. And if I truly care about my community, the work may eventually ask me to consider the values, loyalties, and losses I'm hearing from those around me that see the challenge differently. Look, the effects of this virus have been awful and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. And although I truly believe live free or die is a sentiment that misses the mark for a ton of reasons, there's a second part to that line from General Stark. Live free or die, death is not the worst of evils. And might I suggest to all of us that forgetting our shared humanity during this crisis may be one of those unseen evils of this virus. We're all a part of the mess, and so we all have work to do when we consider tonight's leadership behavior. Let's get to work. That said, I want to remind you of a few things before we get to our guests this evening. One, there's always an after party, so if you'd like to get the conversation going in the chat box, I'll be taking a look at that throughout the night. Please give me your reactions to that last segment uh, and your reactions to our guests coming up. And if you can't join us in the Zoom room, uh, Julian's helping us out tonight as always on tech. 
Big thanks to Julian for uh, being a part of the show. Join us in the Zoom room. He'll pin the uh, link up there in the chat box, and we will uh, be sure to uh, be ready for you in the after party discussing all sorts of things this evening. That discussion will certainly include uh, commentary uh, based on our first guest. Uh, I want to uh, introduce and uh, get ready to bring onto the show Kenny Wilk. Well, my audio went out there. My apologies. Kenny is the Vice President of Government and Community Affairs for the University of Kansas Health System. And uh, he's going to talk tonight about the healthcare response in times of uh, crisis and really gives us perspective on a larger municipality look at what's been going on with COVID-19. As he is someone who knows a lot about the KU Med Center, the Kansas Health System, and a lot of the collaborative work that's being done across uh, state boundaries in Kansas City. Kenny, welcome to the show. Kenny Wilk, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you. Great to be with you, DJ. I'm looking forward to the visit. Excellent. Okay, start with, just give us a little background. Um, we've already introduced on the show your role and an official title and all that fun stuff, but what has the last month, month and a half been like for you uh, in your role with the University of Kansas Health Systems? I, I've been in the work world for uh, 40 plus years. And I've had uh, lots and lots of opportunities to do lots of different things. Actually, I was chairing the House Appropriations Committee on September 11, 2001. So went through all of that. But I would tell you the last month, has there's been nothing like it. Um, it, it has been uh, an incredible experience in many ways. Uh, every emotion that you can imagine uh, has been experienced, and of course, you can kind of cut this so many different ways. But you know, if you're in healthcare and you're in any role in healthcare, you're on the front line. If you're not on the front line, you're you're supporting those front line people. You feel a tremendous responsibility to do any and everything you can, no matter what your role in the healthcare system, to support them. The University of Kansas Health System represents the only academic medical center in the state of Kansas. Wilkes Institution has found itself at the forefront of patient care while also trying to be on the leading edge of researching the virus. Every hour of the day, particularly initially, we were learning something new. So our, our job was to per perfect the care for our own patients and our own staff. And then as, as quickly as we could disseminate that and help other people know what we were learning. And, and that's been a constant with us. So we are caring but we're also trying to teach and help and lead uh, in every way possible in regard uh, to this terrible virus. And, and I, I couldn't be prouder of our team. We, we've tried to do all those things and it's created great stress. Uh, could we do it better? Is there more that we can do? You bet. Uh, but every day we've been out front on, on the care front and we've been out front on trying to educate and, and, and help people know how to safely take care of these folks. Wilkes feels the KU Health System is in a solid position to do this work because of some tough early decisions. We had to shut down, as did all every other hospital in the state of Kansas, all your elective procedures. That typically is, you know, somewhere around half of what everybody does. You take whether you're, it's all relative, right? If you're in a critical access hospital, that's still a big deal. If you're in a big hospital, it's, it's a big deal. See, you, you just shut down half of your operation. Despite that huge financial loss for the hospital, it's allowed KU Med to divert supplies where they are needed most during this pandemic. Healthcare providers, first responders, we know as long as they have the proper equipment, can care for these patients and not be infected. It cannot be overstated, cannot be overstated how important that is. Well, those supplies were not built up. There's competition all over the world to get that. So that, 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 that was a really motivating fear in the early days of this, that we were going to run out of PPE, not just us, but, but other hospitals. M managed to get ahead of that. So, you know, the, 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 the first week or two, it, it literally felt like you were in a totally different world. And I've never worked harder. And, and the fact of the matter is, I, I probably never accomplished less. Uh, but, but, you know, you were just chasing any and everything. Uh, 
after about a, a week or 10 days, you know, the numbers started settling in. We started to find a rhythm. And I'd actually say the last two weeks, we haven't hit a new normal. I don't think hospitals have hit a new normal. But I think we're all doing a much better job of managing the care. And as the research for how to best care for COVID-19 patients continues, Wilkes also believes the healthcare system has a role to play in preparing society for a new normal. Hospitals have to care then for the sick patients that end up in, in their hospitals. They also have to help folks that are caring for patients in their home. But now thirdly, uh, and I think an equally important responsibility, we have to help folks learn how we're going to live with this disease. We have to now replace the fear that we've all experienced the last month with the respect for this virus. We're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to live with it. We can live with it. There, there's, there's practices that we're going to have to accept. It's not gonna be a light switch, uh, but we're gonna have to get the economy turned back on when, when the numbers say that it's safe to move forward. It looks like Kansas is moving in that direction, but we will all have a lot of work to do. Hmm. Hospitals and caregivers will be right at the center of all of those activities. So it's really changed, uh, the roles that we were all playing six weeks ago. Um, but I think by and large, hospitals across this state have delivered. Uh, they've adapted and pivoted at warp speed. For a longtime partner of KLC, that quick adaptation has Wilkes thinking about the leadership framework. I always have tried to think about it, man. It, wouldn't it be nice if you could just do, you know, diagnosis situation, energize others, manage yourself, and skillfully intervene, and you know, you. That's not the way it works. You got to hold them all simultaneously. You, you got to manage them all collectively, knowing which triggers to pull and which not, and, and move it along. There's a hard way to explain that. But what this pandemic has, has displayed is the necessity to do that at a speed that I don't think anybody has been prepared for. Wilkes knows the virus is likely not going anywhere anytime soon. But he also sees a new spirit of collaboration that he hopes will remain beyond this pandemic. I, th I think longer term, you're going to see the relationship with hospitals, caregivers, and actually policymakers and public health uh, change. And, and by the way, it should. So, so the need to have those relationships and, and be able to reach out. And literally today, you got to pick up the phone. That's what we're doing. But there's still no replacement for, for having to know that people kind of know their values, know that you can communicate. It, it is absolutely critical. And so when I think about skillfully, uh, you know, intervening and energizing others, uh, it, it is absolutely critical. Um, and, 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 you know, I made myself a note, you know, the skillfully intervening, we all study that. Um, in a pandemic, sometimes a skillful gets set aside because of the need to operate at such a warp speed. Uh, but then it's the relationships because you know, I don't offend you because you know I'm, I'm, I'm running on a short fuse. We're all trying to do the right thing. If we get it wrong, you, you don't mind picking the phone up and saying, hey, Kenny, uh, we think you're wrong on this one. And so I, I, I think of it as, as uh, you know, piloting a program or experimenting. You do it quickly. You try to learn readjust and redeploy having those relationships across the board being able to work and in and, and kansas city uh, we have the need uh, also dj to work across the state line and, and we have discovered uh, there's there's times uh, that that's worked really well and then there's lots of lots of opportunities for improvement and that desire to get better already has wilkes thinking about the learning environment that this pandemic has created. It's always going to be the preferred model to have the time to step back, reflect, think, evaluate. That's always, and I think that's how you have to learn. But I also think this teaches us if we could put together some modules in a KLC environment where in the safety of a classroom, you could mimic a crisis situation and, and force people to make decisions, and, and DJ, that, that, that's one of the things that you've seen with this pandemic. It forces people to make decisions, and they can be very uncomfortable. You will never be able to diagnose a situation in a pandemic to the degree that you'd like. 
you, you, you just, you can't, it's frustrating, but you still got to decide. But wouldn't it be great if we could figure out a way in a KLC classroom to set that up and, and force that experience and let people feel what that feels like to be operating at warp speed. And until we have the opportunity to test the models that Wilkes is experiencing right now within the healthcare system, we're reminded that there is hope on the horizon. In Kenny Wilkes' opinion, uh, the way we're going to get out of this uh, is we're going to replace the fear with the respect for the virus. We're going to learn to deal with it. And our scientists and our researchers in this country, and we have some really gifted ones uh, right here in Kansas that are right in the middle of the R&D front on this. They're going to figure this out. They're going to deliver us new medications and a vaccine that will then lead us to get back to where we need to be. I am proud, I am proud that our state has the resources and the talent to be able to contribute to that. And, and I think we should all feel good about it uh, you know, we've made an investment in those institutions for the last hundred and some odd years, uh, and I believe they're standing up and delivering for Kansas. I'd just be interested in this to, to round things out. Um, is there anything left unsaid or unasked on my end that, that you would want to share with people right now from your perspective? I don't want to understate uh, the pain, uh, and if you're one of those that are unemployed, um, uh, my heart goes out to you. I, I would just uh, close by saying, as tough as this is, and it is tough, uh, we are all going to learn a lot from this. We are going to get through it. Uh, and there's going to be some real positives come out of this. Um, there, there's going, telemedicine, we didn't talk about that. Maybe we can come back and talk another time. Uh, that's been transformed. I don't think that's going to go back. That's going to serve Kansans and others uh, for years to come. And, and we're also, some of the, the relationships that we talked about uh, and people learning to work across uh, uh, different entities. I think we're all going to get better and there's going to be lots of other positives that come out. We just got to remain hopeful. Uh, we got to continue to follow the rules, social distance, be safe. Really important now uh, as the governor and other leaders, this is critically important. As we begin to turn on the economy, It'll be done most likely by a region and by phase. And, and, and people can please, please try to adhere to that. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to limit the social gathering and we're going to have to go slow because we don't want to repeat. I understand that'll be painful. But if we can follow those guidelines, all stick together in the long term, uh, we're, we're going to be fine. And I really do believe we'll come out uh, uh, with some real positives out of all of this. Kenny Wilk, thank you so much for joining us on The Late Show. It's uh, been a great pleasure. DJ, thank you for the invitation. I hope we get to join you again sometime. Absolutely. Just an absolute pleasure to have Kenny on the show, and I want to thank him so much for uh, taking so much time spending it with me. Uh, amidst a very busy, busy season for uh, Kenny and the entire U University of Kansas health system. Well, so many good comments rolling in tonight, and uh, just thankful for all of you checking out the show live this evening. Thanks for joining us. Reminder, conversation continues on Zoom afterwards. We may get into my uh, behavior conversation a little bit, a little conflictual interpretation from Jeff Mandel. Always appreciated, and we will sling no arrows at Jeff. Uh, I needed that opening statement for me. It's been a rough week. Uh, I'm struggling a little bit. And so I was speaking to myself and uh, others got to listen. That's how that one goes. And I think I placed the blame squarely on me as part of the mess to do some of the work. I've got some frustrations with uh, authority uh, to, to name on a bunch of different levels. And I don't put it all on the protesters at all. I, I'm uh, calling myself out. So I hope you heard that in my opening comments. Um, that we called the behavior, and we'll, we'll try that again. Let's speak a little bit about Kenny and what you all heard in the interview from Kenny. I want to go over to the comments. Uh, Seth Bate joining us tonight, and Seth, you called out my favorite line from that whole interview. You got to hold them uh, all simultaneously, the power um, and the challenge of the competencies, right? This idea that you have to hold them all at the same time. They're not linear. I, I can't tell you how many rooms I am in where people say, well, just give me the order. What do I do first? And it is so dependent on what's going on. It just doesn't feel like that. 
Um, and Seth, probably my, my second favorite quote, or actually maybe my favorite, I've never worked harder, and the fact of the matter is I've never accomplished less. I think Kenny just captured what this experience is like for those of us who have the blessing and pressure of work to do. Absolutely. Well said, Seth. Uh, others weighing in. Yeah, Ian reminds us, no arrows in the after party, just a good old conversation that, that we'll need some more of. Um, and Jeff weighs in, finally, someone in authority on the front lines who mentions learning as a goal. Yeah, look, I, uh, I struggle with authorities not taking blame, uh, not saying the words, I don't know, we'll have to figure it out. But we also, the system puts pressure on our elected authorities, right, to have answers and to tell us what the solutions are. So yeah, we've uh, we've created a bit of our own mess on this one through representative democracy. I was I was rereading rereading the uh, Federalist uh, Number Ten paper today, just uh, seeing if that fit into my my show at all, and I didn't end up using it in my opening segment. That that reminder that this Republican state was always supposed to be about uh, minorities not getting weighed out, minority factions, because we'd have all these different powers in place, right? All these different checks. And uh, it's an interesting time for all of that. But I think the system that we've created actually puts pressure on authorities to say they have answers and to uh, tell us what the solutions will be. So uh, it certainly creates some uh, interesting conversation along the way. Uh, Amy uh, weighing in tonight. And Amy said that uh, she's been thinking about uh, putting the model into practice isn't nice, neat, and orderly. It's messy. And she's been reflected on the, reflecting on the Hebrew uh, meaning of messy since last week. Yeah, belagan, right? A uh, Hebrew word I brought back. But this idea that it's good to go through the mess, that we uh, look forward to addressing the mess, going through it, and what we might learn from it. So full circle back to Jeff's comments, that we might actually learn something in this, and we could name that. Uh, Ian, again, forcing actions during the pandemic, that's one of the things I see as a silver lining. So much more experimentation uh, and doing things different has led to some great innovations and change during this time. And I hope we don't lose everything that we've learned. You know what's interesting is this has been an ongoing conversation in the after party. What will we keep and uh, what will we quickly forget that we've learned uh, once life returns to quote unquote normal? There may be a new normal, but uh, we, we know that there will be work on the other side of this that, that feels a little bit more like the work before this. And we do have to begin wondering what it will feel like, what normal will be like. Um, I just am so excited about the conversation that's taking place tonight. I want to thank you. Uh, all for being a part of it. A couple reminders before we wrap up the show and take it over to Zoom. One, be sure to check out the KLC Journal. I know when I throw up the graphics tonight, I'm losing audio, but I wanted to give you a chance to see that article that's coming up. School meals um, will go on even though COVID-19 stops. Much else in Kansas. A great news story on what it means to feed students. It's a topic we talked about early on here on Leadership Late Night, that perhaps one of the um, other purposes of the education system has actually been to feed children and how that missing piece really needs to be taken care of. The KLC Journal doing a great job as always covering that and more. Check that out at klcjournal.com. Well, that said, it's time to move the conversation over to Zoom. I want to thank you for joining us on episode seven of Leadership Late Night. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And for those of you watching the replay, be sure to throw your comments up on the Facebook page in the YouTube comments section. Let us know what you heard and uh, how we can continue to provide information uh, in the midst of this COVID-19 era. Always a pleasure to be with you. Always a pleasure to get the conversation going and always welcoming of all the interpretations that we need to test so we can work toward progress in this world. That said, everybody have a great night. And DJ AJ, go to bed. Good night, Dad. Now, your moments of hope.